uh, brought to you by Dr. Colleen Lance, pulmonologist and internal medicine, and Dr. Sanjeev Kaur of the Cleveland Clinic Sleep Center. Um, this piece of information, we sleep for a third of our lives. That's 27 years if you live to 81. <laughs> sleep is crucial for the body to stay alive, but where do you go and what do you do when your body sleeps? After all, you don't ex stop existing when you're asleep. I prefer the 100 acre wood. Hope that's worth the case. In that case, Dr. Colleen. Good morning. Good morning. Um, there's a few points that I'm going to discuss for a few moments. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Someone said, uh, I will try to project. So just to let you know a little bit about myself, I live here in Shaker, although I was in Texas for 28 years and practiced there. This time of year is hard. <laughs> so, but my children are both in the Shaker schools. I have one right next door at the middle school and one at the high school. And Dr. Cower also lives here in Shaker, so this is our community. This is the room I always vote in, so thank you so much for including us. So, ever since the year started with the number two, I've practiced nothing but sleep medicine. Prior to that, I had an internal medicine practice, and then I went back and did a sleep medicine fellowship. So, for me, it's something I'm passionate about. And that is completely what I practice on a daily basis. Some people find this information shocking. If you look at what our expected sleep need is, newborns, toddlers, the young, that's not shocking at all. They sleep a lot. We expect them to sleep a lot. Now, teenagers, and there have been some really interesting studies done at sleep camps that Dr. Karskadden has in um, California. And she did all the original research on teenagers to find out what their sleep need is. And in order for a teen to function properly, the average sleep need is nine and a quarter hours. Now how many teenagers are actually getting that? None. 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 Exactly, with the pressures put on them from school, extracurricular activities, um, they're even expected to get up and do classes prior to school starting now. It's amazing, they call it zero period. So there's all this pressure, and then being able to develop friendships and all, they tend to be up late, and very few of them really get enough sleep. So what about us in our age group? So the typical need ranges from about seven to nine hours a night. Now there's some people that fall outside of that, there is no magic number where someone has to say, I have to get this. You know, everyone's a little bit different and it can be very individual. A lot depends on how much sleep does it take for you to feel good and be functional during the day and maintain your relationships and your activities during the day. So what determines our sleep-wake cycle? One of the biggest triggers is daylight. That's probably the biggest thing I had a hard time adjusting to here <laughs> in Texas. Wow, it's bright, it's in your face. Um, but here, it's tougher in the winter. So what happens from a neurological standpoint is there's a portion of your brain that perceives the daylight. And then when the daylight goes away, it releases a trigger to the brain to release melatonin. So that's something we hear about melatonin a lot. But what the brain does is it releases a tiny bit of melatonin, just a little tiny burst when the sun goes down. And that's a trigger for your body to start dropping its temperature to prepare you for sleep. So it's one of the strongest triggers. That's pretty tough in this part of the country. Um, particularly this time of year. So I am really looking forward to spring. <laughs> so this is a all, uh, yes. <laughs> we have a uh, sleep. Yeah, right. <clears throat> so something that we teach our fellows um, is something called a two process model, which means what how does your brain respond to the drive to go to sleep and the drive to be alert and functional during the day? So if you look at the times of day, you should, this is alertness here on this graph, and this is the time of day here. 
When you first wake up in the morning, you should be at your most alert. That's what the expectation is. And as most of us experience, after lunch, you get a little tiny dip. Unfortunately, naps are frowned upon in the United States. I married a Brazilian, so we are firm believers in an afternoon nap. I am part Brazilian on that uh, front. And then you get a burst of energy, and then your alertness should drop to its lowest to prepare you to go to sleep, about the time that we lose that natural daylight. So that's one of the processes going on. <coughs> Another process, we call it process S in our world, but what happens is something called sleep pressure. In other words, that's that drive to go to sleep, that irresistible urge to go to sleep. When you first wake up in the morning and green is normal, that pressure to go to sleep should be at its absolute lowest. And then over the course of the day, it should climb and be at its absolute highest before bedtime. What happens if you take a nap? It completely drops back down to normal, back down to how things were when you first woke up in the morning. And then that climb has to start all over again. That's why one of the things we do when people have trouble falling asleep at the beginning of the night is to eliminate daytime naps so that that drive to go to sleep is at its absolute highest. I usually roll back when I'm talking with patients about that because people don't like getting up from naps. <laughs> it's a very hard thing. So what about as we get all older? It's not quite as impressive that drive or our brain's push to go to sleep is not quite as strong as it used to be, just not quite as robust. So over time, that starts to flatten. And there's some studies out there that talk about the brain's secretion of melatonin starts dropping over time. So you don't get that nice, bright burst of melatonin as soon as the sun goes down. So things just are dampened down with time. Now something that we love to look at when we bring someone to the sleep lab and we hook them up to 26 different things, you know, we love as, as much data as we can get our hands on in the sleep lab. We make a summary called a hypnogram, which is what this is a picture of. So if we take all that data and squish it onto one piece of paper and see what stage of sleep people are in during the course of the night, this would be normal. So you start the night out where you're awake and very quickly, you should descend into the different stages of sleep. Stage one and two are very transitional. We call this chunk here and here and here in lavender. That's the <coughs> slow wave sleep. That's when your body physically catches up on its rest. And you get the biggest chunks of that in the first portion of the night. That's where hormones reset and the ability for uh, keeping cholesterol under control. You know, these stages of sleep are very important for metabolism. There's a lot of work looking at obesity and what happens during slow wave sleep. And then, about every 90 minutes, you should get a little burst of dream or rapid eye movement sleep. And you should get more and more of that throughout the course of the night. Now, REM sleep or dream sleep that's when your brain catches up on its rest. And this is what um, gives you the ability to have good memory, mood, and concentration. I heard some chuckling across the room. <laughs> now, one of the reasons that um, women present very differently from men when it comes to certain sleep disorders has to do a lot with REM sleep. Our REM sleep is a little more sensitive or more prone to have things like sleep apnea during dream sleep. So we may present very differently. We may present with memory, mood, and concentration problems instead of some of the more obvious symptoms. So if you have interruption or disruption or not enough of any of these stages of sleep, you're going to be affected during the daytime. So if you have interruptions with this, what we call slow wave sleep, you're gonna be physically exhausted during the day and very sleepy. 
if you have disruption or you cut your night's sleep, like here we've got eight hours, say you sleep five or six hours, if you've missed the last big chunks of REM or rapid eye movement sleep, it's not uncommon for people to come in saying, I just can't concentrate during the day, my memory is poor, um, I'll get referrals from neurologists who see people for dementia or early memory <coughs> issues. And one of the things they look at is, is their REM sleep interrupted for some reason? Is it maybe not getting enough of it because you've cut your overnight sleep short? So being generous with your overnight sleep is important for these reasons. Now, this is uh, a picture where the top portion is like what we saw in the previous slide. But what happens as we get older? It takes, a, it takes a little bit longer to fall asleep. As you're descending into the different stages of sleep, it's a little more disrupted, especially during the first portion of that night. You have more arousals during the night where you're awake for longer periods during the night you have less of this what we call slow wave sleep. You know, when the hormones reset and your body catches up on its rest. So we start seeing changes in the sleep architecture just from normal aging. And then what we see over time is it becomes safety concerns. And a lot of times I've, I'll see people after they've had an accident, um, even a micro sleep, uh, you know, a portion of a second and they fall asleep at the wheel and they'll drive off the road and hit something. More than half of Americans report that they have been driving while they're sleeping. More than half. That makes me nervous when I get on the freeway. <laughs> More than a quarter when they're at work. This is an area in medicine that we're looking at now. There's been a lot of changes for our trainees over the last decade because traditionally, most of us, when we train, we're incredibly sleep deprived. So we're starting to look at medical errors in relationship to sleep deprivation, and just not getting enough. So I'm gonna change gears here a little bit and talk about some of the disorders associated with sleep and what people come to us complaining of. Now, Insomnia in itself is not a diagnosis. It's a symptom. And the reasons for insomnia, it's one of the longest first visits I have with a patient because the reasons can be, it can be a multitude of reasons. And very rarely, and I like to picture it as a pie, very rarely is there just one piece of pie mixed in with someone's insomnia. It's usually several pieces and you've got to tease it out over time. So most Americans have said that they've had insomnia at some point in time, and 10 to 15% have it chronically or more than six months in length. Now, those that are more prone to have difficulty falling asleep and staying asleep, women, if we look at studies of, that they've done looking at every species out there, from the mole all the way up to the human, women are more arousable. I think it has to do with caring for the young. So women tend to be more arousable, tend to have more problems with insomnia, not infrequently. I will say, hear a woman say, I can't sleep at night, and the person lying beside me sleeps like a log. <laughs> so, and, and boy, is that frustrating. That makes it even worse. The older we get, for the reasons we saw in the previous slide, we start struggling with difficulties falling asleep and staying asleep. Mood disorders, specifically, waking up at like three and four o'clock in the morning, when people are depressed, it starts changing their sleep architecture. They start getting big chunks of dream sleep early in the night, and then late in the night, they start waking up. It's like you flip their sleep architecture around. So when I hear that someone's waking up in the wee hours of the morning, one of the things we talk about is mood. One of the many things we talk about. So one of the most important things, we call it sleep hygiene. I'm not quite sure I like that name. 
if you're unhygienic, if it's not clean. But anyway, we call it sleep hygiene. So this has to do with keeping things regular and what happens in your bedroom environment. So for those of you that had children, if you had children that had difficulty falling asleep or they woke up in the middle of the night, did you take them and plop them in front of the TV? No. Did you start playing, turn on all the lights and play exciting games? No. You need to start preparing them and being generous with their bedtime. Also, it's important that sleep in the bedroom, and we try to keep the bedroom for sleep and intimacy only, because what happens is, if you start having other activities, can you hear me? You gotta get right out to it. Okay. If you start having other activities in bed in the bedroom, your brain starts confusing what you're supposed to be doing during that time. So we try to keep it as sleep and intimacy only. You know, a lot of people will have their computers, their checkbooks, their phones. They have all sorts of things going on in the bedroom environment. Even we try to clean that up. So a lot of people think that getting on devices is just for the kids. I think one of my favorite stories was a man who totally busted his wife because uh, her complaint was insomnia. And he's like, I can tell you why. He's over there under the covers scrolling through pictures of the grandkids. Oh, <laughs> 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 took care of that and things were a lot better. Um, what happens with our devices is there is um, that blue light that comes from the screen. It's just like daylight. And what we saw on the earlier slide, when you have daylight, it inhibits those triggers that tell your brain that it's time to go to sleep. There are some things out there that can filter out um, blue light that we use to help people shift their sleep-wake cycle in one direction or the other. But the absolute best thing is to get away from the electronic devices, our smartphones, our tablets, scrolling through social media at bedtime. That's a tough one. Who, who all has a Facebook or Twitter account in the room? <laughs> or more than one? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna ask you if you do it and scroll through in bed or not. <laughs> okay, so what do we do for insomnia? <coughs> in Could you define insomnia? It's a symptom. So difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep, and not feeling refreshed from how your long? sleep. You mean how like long to get to bed, bed, or how long when you're awake? You're awake period. So we call normal the normal time for being able to fall asleep is from 20 to 30 minutes. And some people say they have a hard time going to sleep. And I'm like, how long does it take you? And it's they're like, well. Every night it's 20 minutes, so then we have to talk about some expectations. So that's an excellent question. Waking up during the night. Now, some arousals are normal. And the question becomes, are you able to fall back to sleep? Because not, some people will wake up, but they fall back to sleep, and it's fine. They feel fine during the day, and we leave that alone. That's okay. There are even, there's historical models looking back over time. <coughs> Uh, humans used to sleep in two big chunks. One big chunk um, at the beginning of the night, then they would wake up and have some sort of activity, and then go sleep for a second big chunk of time. So um, not all arousals are abnormal. So what do we do to try to help? I usually try to figure out if there's an underlying cause. Is there a mood disorder causing you to wake up? Is there a medical problem, medication causing you to wake up? Um, an underlying sleep problem, we'll talk about a few in a, in a couple of minutes. But if we don't find an underlying problem to treat, I, one of the first things people tend to reach for are medications. That's one thing we love to do in America. It's a very pharmacological society. Me personally, I don't, adhere to that. There are circumstances where using medication can help, but usually behavioral management is the absolute best way to approach insomnia. So we talked about a little bit of, of things earlier, the sleep hygiene and stimulus control. Those were the things I was talking about, cleaning up that bedroom environment and what's going on in your bed and bedroom. 
um, around the time of bedtime. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. That has been proven over and over again to be the absolute best, most successful, and most long-lasting way to treat cognitive, uh, to treat insomnia. So people ask, what is it? And there's very few people in the country that actually can do this form of therapy. It's usually done by a psychologist who's trained specifically in this therapy. And I like to describe it as, your brain is a computer, and we need to redo the software. Something wrong has happened with the software, so we've got to reprogram you so that you can go to sleep at night. Um, we happen to have two people who do this at the Cleveland Clinic. I was so happy when I moved here uh, and was able to work with them. Because that's the first time I've been in a place that had, I mean, had at least one, but two, who can do cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. And if we use this in conjunction with a short-acting hypnotic or sleeping pill for a short period of time, that is the absolute most successful way of approaching insomnia. The reason I have the picture off to the side is for our patients who have trouble getting in to see someone for cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, we have an online platform, and it's called Go to Sleep. So for those of you that do like to get on the devices, and as long as you're not looking at it while you're in bed at night, <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, this is a good way of, it helps track your sleep, works on sleep hygiene and what we call stimulus control. You get a little score each day. So it's like walking through things with the psychologist to help you fall asleep and stay asleep longer. We're gonna talk about just a few of the most common sleep disorders that we run into. <laughs> so is it, who's heard of restless leg syndrome before? About a decade ago, I would ask that question, there might have been one or two people in the room. So we're starting to get the word out there about restless legs. So lots of ways of describing it, but it's an urgency to move where you just can't stay still. And there's what we call a circadian rhythm to it, where there's certain times of day where you're more prone to have this feeling. It doesn't have to be just your legs. I would rather call it restless body. I've seen people who can't keep their head still, their hands still, not, not just those that have to move their hands when they talk. Um, but there's also an asleep version of it where you get in bed, you have difficulty calming down, staying um, immobile. And once you fall asleep, there can be a rhythmical kicking and twitching of the legs. And it can be enough to wake you up during the night and keep you awake. So this can be a cause of insomnia, both difficulty falling asleep and staying asleep. So we see this associated with several underlying medical problems because there's certain things that are just very irritating to nerve endings. If you have diabetes and your sugar is out of control, nerve endings can shudder. Um, if your iron levels are low, and people that have restless legs really push their iron levels higher than we would mean for someone who's anemic because there's something called dopamine that you need to make and that creates a little filter that sits between the nerve and muscle and it filters out all the incoming noise and keeps things quiet so you can go to sleep. And you need a lot of iron to make dopamine. One of the first things I go over when someone has restless legs is ingestions. And I'm not saying that these are things that you get rid of forever, but the things that can drive your legs nuts, caffeine, alcohol, nicotine, and if you have someone who's eating tons of chocolate in the evening. <laughs> so I'm not necessarily saying that you have to give those things up forever, well, with the exception of nicotine. Nicotine is very hard to treat restless legs if there's nicotine on board. So we really try to get people off nicotine for that as well as other reasons. Um, but for a while, we try to get rid of the alcohol, the chocolate, get the sugars under control. And sometimes that alone is enough to quiet things down. There are medications <coughs> that work like dopamine that sit between that little nerve ending and muscle ending um, to quiet things down. So there are medications to help. So I'm gonna minimalist on pills. Oh no, she's gonna talk about apnea. 
It's like, why does everyone keep talking about sleep apnea? Because it's so important. It touches just about every single medical problem out there. And we used to think it was just a disorder of people that were really heavy. But that's not the case. You can be pencil thin and have significant sleep apnea. It's a problem of the upper airway where the airway collapses. And what happens is, every time that airway collapses, your body's gonna do anything it can to stop that from happening. So you're not gonna get into the deep restful stages of sleep. Your dream sleep's gonna be interrupted. Memory, mood, concentration problems. Every time that airway closes, you get a spike in blood pressure, a drop in oxygen level, the natural pacemakers of the heart start firing like crazy. So we see a lot of problems with heart issues, heart rhythm problems, blood pressure increasing, blood sugar increasing. This is just a cartoon. If you're looking at somebody from the side, nose, mouth, the blue is air. And here you've got a nice open airway. With obstructive sleep apnea, you don't. So when you go to sleep at night, you lose control of the muscle and the airway collapses. And it's usually multifactorial. It has to do with the structure of the jaw, the tongue base, the soft palate, the nose. So it's rarely just one simple thing that's causing the obstruction. Now, I'm gonna pause here for a moment. Dr. Cowers is gonna come talk briefly about the treatment of sleep apnea. Thank you, Dr. Lawrence. And thank you everyone for having me here. I'm Sanjay Kaur. I did my internal medicine residency and currently doing sleep medicine fellowship here at Cleveland Clinic. So regarding sleep apnea, uh, as Dr. Lawrence described, it's basically like, you know, the chronic and obstruction of your airway that happens while you're sleeping. Uh, your body has protective mechanisms to deal with it. Uh, so that's why it's not like, you know, people, people are like, you know, oh, I, is it like obstructing? Am I like dying right here? No, but your body has protective mechanism. Your brain wakes up and kind of recruits your muscles back in and then your airways get open and then you breathe fine again. So, but that happens like recurrently. So your brain is never able to get into that restful deep stages of sleep. And then you see the adverse effects next morning. So you're like, you know, my patients tell me, you know, I spent eight hours in bed, but still when I wake up in the morning, I'm tired. I feel, I don't feel refreshed in the morning. That's because your brain was working extra hard at night. It was kind of having this micro arousals multiple times every hour to make sure that your airway is open. So the gold standard treatment for sleep apnea is the back therapy. Uh, so it's positive airway pressure therapy. So what it basically does is that it gives air under pressure. That's it. The CPAP machines or the bi-level PAP machines, BiPAPs that you hear about, they provide air under pressure. So your upper airway is a soft tube. So if you fill it with air, it kind of splint opens your airway. So now your airway is going to stay open and you sleep fine because those obstructions are not going to happen because it's a soft tube and you have split <coughs> open your ear. So what it causes is it, you know, it eventually leads to like a restful sleep and the majority of my patients, like they come and tell me that, okay, now I sleep so much better and I wake up refreshed in the morning because now you are going into those deep stages of sleep and uh, you really wake up refreshed. Um, these are like the short-term benefits of it. Like, you know, that your daytime sleepiness and fatigue is a lot improved and uh, you're a lot more refreshed. You are able to carry out your daily activities uh, in a much better fashion. And what is the, what is the long-term effect? So the reason uh, recently, like, you know, sleep apnea is so much talked about is because studies have shown, uh, and as Dr. Lance mentioned, in long term, uh, sleep apnea leads to, to increased risk of high blood pressure, diabetes, stroke, heart rhythm problems like atrial fibrillation. So long term, if we keep using the CPAP, then does it really help us? So studies have been done which show that long term compliance with CPAP leads to better control of blood pressure, 
uh, in many patients, like you know, they have been on like multiple medications for blood pressure before they start the path therapy. And once they start the path therapy, we are able to cut down on the number of medications that they were on. Uh, similarly, it helps to uh, control the blood glucose better in diabetics. And uh, there have been studies that have shown that uh, CPAP adherence in elderly patients who had like a mild cognitive impairment and obstructive sleep apnea. So it improved uh, cognition compared with the folks who were not compliant with CPAP therapy. And similar studies have also been done with uh, patients with heart rhythm problems. So if somebody has atrial fibrillation and the sleep apnea, and they start using the CPAP and get compliant with it, the chances of recurrence of the atrial fibrillation episodes in patients with paroxysmal effect are less when compared to the folks who are not using the CPAP. <coughs> so CPAP comes with like certain challenges too, because uh, as one of our attending mentions, it's you know how do you make a primate wear something on his face while sleeping? <laughs> So it is challenging for sure, uh, but uh, over the last 10 years, like you know, there has been a lot of uh, uh, key development in this area. The CPAP machines that we have now, they are like a lot more quieter. They practically are not supposed to make any noise at night. And uh, they are way smaller, something that you can you know, carry around even on your vacations. They are a lot more portable. Uh, at the same time, we have different kind of mask options. So it's not that, you know, I don't like this mask and we are kind of limited with that. So uh, we do offer uh, a clinic what we call bath map therapy. Uh, this is something where uh, we bring you in during daytime and uh, our experienced technician spends an hour with you where uh, we help you adjust with the mask just to see, you know, what challenges you're facing and what mask will work the best for you and help you with that. So this is the gold standard, and uh, that's why we really recommend it. And then it is like something that is, if you think about it, it is non-invasive in a certain way. It's kind of a mask you're wearing at night and then you remove it. It's not something that you're ingesting or not an intra or anything in that sense. But still, like we do understand that CPAP is not for everybody. There are patients who have tried it, and they're like, you know, it, it's not for me. I have tried whatever I could, but it doesn't work for me. So then we do have some alternate therapies, and uh, Dr. Lance will discuss those. So this is when I'm seeing someone for the first time for sleep apnea. I usually lay out what the treatment therapies are if we think they have significant apnea. CPAP is normally where we start. The insurance covers it. It's non-invasive. We know that it will work. We can get that airway splinted open with a column of air. And if we can hold someone's hand through getting them used to it and supporting them, then people are able to use it. There are circumstances where we need to move on to alternative therapy. So when I need to do that, usually second line is um, something called oral mandibular advancing dental appliances. And there are many different kinds. And it's a dental appliance that you wear between your teeth at night. And what the goal is, is to bring your lower jaw forward to get the base of the tongue out of the way of the airway. It doesn't work for everyone. When we're considering this, we look at people that have mild to moderate apnea. For severe apnea, it doesn't work terribly well. I've had some rare circumstances where we've been able to get that airway open, but you've really got to move that jaw far forward. So in someone with mild to moderate apnea, and if they haven't tolerated CPAP, a good next step would be a dental appliance. We try to find a dentist who, number one, does this all the time. We have several at the clinic in dentistry that this is what they focus on. You want someone who's not making one or two of these a month, and you want one that's adjustable, where they very slowly, millimeter by millimeter, inch that lower jaw forward. Because the joint right here with your mandible is very sensitive, and just if you yank that lower jaw forward quickly, it can be painful, and you can cause problems with the bite. So you want to very slowly move that forward, and then once it's in place, we can do a home sleep study to make, while you're wearing it to make sure that the apnea is gone. And some insurances are covering a portion of these now. So there's been a lot of activity in, in getting these covered. Um, 
But let the sleep specialist guide you in that and set you up with someone who does this all the time. Now, if CPAP hasn't worked for you, general appliance doesn't seem to work for you, we sometimes get the ear, nose, and throat surgeon involved looking for surgical options. If we're looking at children with apnea, if we get their tonsils and adenoids out, 85% of the time we've taken care of their apnea. But for adults, though, that's not the case. So if we're considering surgery, we set you up with an ear, nose, and throat doctor who this is their area of focus. And there's a special scope that they can do while you're sleeping to see how your airway closes. And based on the appearance of how your airway closes, they can predict what types of surgeries um, could work and would it be successful. <coughs> Lastly, has anyone heard about Inspire? Okay, there's a lot of advertisements out there about Inspire. It's an implantable pacemaker. It's exactly like the heart pacemakers. <coughs> it, it's implanted in the chest wall, but instead of the wires going to the heart, the wires go to the nerve at the base of the tongue that tell the tongue to get out of the way of the airway every time you take a breath at night and you turn it on with a remote control at nighttime. We do not go down the, this pathway lightly. It's usually my last step. I've got several patients that are using it, but th this is invasive. So we do this for people with um, moderately severe to severe apnea with a body mass index that is not, we don't do this in the obese population because when you have more weight involved, that airway, there's a lot of extra fat and we can, move that tongue out of the airway all day long doesn't matter if there's too much weight involved. So we do have alternatives. The thing is not to give up. If you're struggling with CPAP, we bring people into our what we call SAM clinic, sleep apnea management. I look at people using their CPAP. It's usually something relatively simple to fix that's irritating. A mass that's leaking, things that are too dry, the addition of a humidifier. So we can usually get around these problems fairly easily. So I'm gonna summarize there. We want you to have a good night's sleep. We know we can help with the other me medical problems and get you feeling better during the day. So we're gonna take a few minutes now and do uh, Q&A time. Yes. Is all apnea obstructive apnea? Microphone. <laughs> very loud voice. <laughs> <laughs> we need to record it. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Close, close, close. close. <laughs> it's all at this angle. Straight out. No. <laughs> this way. Yes? Well, yeah. That's like Donnie and Marie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is all apnea obstructive apnea? No. Uh, there's another kind of apnea called central apnea. I'm sorry, say that again. Central apnea. Central. Yeah. Okay. And then they can be mixed. Where, where the patient have both obstructive and central components. So primarily in obstructive apnea, as you mentioned, that there's obstruction in the airway at some location. Uh, but in central apnea, the drive to breathe uh, that comes from, that signal that comes from the brain, that is missing. So basically that signal is missing, so there is no effort, uh, you know, no chest wall or abdominal effort at all to breathe transiently for a brief period of time. So what would positional sleep apnea be? Because that's what I was diagnosed with years ago. So positional is, uh, so you had a sleep study in I the lab? I did. Okay. So uh, when you have a sleep study, uh, one of the sensors, we actually record your position and uh, the hypnogram that Dr. Lanz earlier showed, kind of, you know, the synopsis of all the information we get from the sleep study. It also gives us information that when you were having those apnea events, were you on your back mm -hmm. or on your side? Uh, we see it's very common that those events are more when you're on your back. So, only when yeah, so in your case, if it was only when you're on your back, but none when you're on your side, then you are, you are what's called positional apnea. Mm -hmm. So in these cases, we, you know, if it is doable, we recommend positional therapy that do not sleep on your back. You know, and th that, that is easier said than done. Exactly. But, but then we have like something called like positional like slumber bells. They have like a, it's kind of a belt that you uh, put on at night. It has a foam at the back. 
So when you're, you sleep on your side, and when you try to go on your back, it kind of puts you back in to stay on your side. <laughs> so that, that's better than the tennis ball. <laughs> exactly, it's like the, the tennis ball, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, some people uh, do well with that. Uh, I had a young gentleman that I saw in the clinic. He actually did positional therapy for about 10 years, yeah. and it, he was feeling fine. But, uh, but then he started experiencing like shoulder pain. And he's like, you know, I, cannot, I can no longer do that. And then we started him on back therapy to see if that would change. Yeah. Um, Dr. Lance, um, there's two parts to this question. If one has, okay, the heart and the lung are adjacent to each other when it comes to breathing. If one would have nodules on their lungs, and maybe not know it, would this interfere with their sleeping? The second question, because I couldn't understand some of the things you said, um, maybe you can answer this. If you, second part of my question, if you have an irregular heartbeat and you're not even aware of it half the time, how does that affect your breathing and sleeping? Okay, so the two, let's do the latter one first. So the two are tightly intertwined. So, uh, and if you are having obstruction or closure of your airway, every time that airway closes, you actually get a pull on the left side of your heart, a spike in um, blood pressure, your oxygen level drops, and then the um, natural pacemakers that you have scattered throughout your heart just start firing like crazy. So the two are tightly intertwined. So if there's anything causing obstruction, we try to remove it. But how so, do you know? So how that's does usually, one know? Well, for people, if there's any symptoms of apnea, usually if there's snoring or you stop breathing at night, um, sleepy during the day, then we look at um, doing a sleep study to find out. And okay. our, yes. Now, when you get fatigued during the day, how do you know if it's lack of sleep or it could be a heart problem, which is uh, fatigue is, is a major heart problem, it's a heart symptom. So how does one know the difference if they get sleepy some days in the afternoon if it's their heart or something else? How do you know? That's why we work uh, closely with our uh, physicians, our internists and cardiologists. So most of our patients come from internal medicine and cardiology. So they've already had everything else looked at, and now they're down to looking at sleep. <laughs> so we work in conjunction with their other doctors because they're tightly intertwined. The one thing you didn't mention that most women I know that I've talked to are up two, three times a night, have an overactive bladder. So <laughs> how does that, when you get up, and uh, how does that affect uh, your sleep, even though you can go back to sleep right away and with no problem? But the fact that it's interrupted two or three times a night. Well, and if the, your internal medicine doctor or, and or urologist hasn't found something that causes you to wake up to urinate, sleep apnea itself can cause you to wake up and urinate, where every time the airway closes, there's a gland in your brain that secretes a hormone that tells your kidneys to make more urine. So treating the apnea can um, help with waking up to urinate at night. So part of when people are complaining of waking up to urinate, they've seen their internist, you know, we work closely with the primary care docs and they send them our way saying, hey, could it be that they're waking up because of apnea? And then we study them. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your presentation. When uh, uh, John Boehner, Ohio's own John Boehner was Speaker of the House, I never believed the thing he said. Yeah. But now that he's a spokesman for medical marijuana, <laughs> he said uh, that uh, marijuana will help you to go to sleep at night and uh, is sometimes an effective remedy for sleep disorders. Should I believe him this time? <laughs> <laughs> the current position at the Cleveland Clinic is that we will not comment on uh, medical marijuana. <laughs> the current position on uh, at the Cleveland Clinic in regards to medical marijuana is we're, we're not to comment on it. 
Yeah, and currently so. American Academy of Sleep Medicine doesn't have a position on it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Um, wouldn't you say, and wouldn't you say in our society that stress and anxiety is affecting uh, one's sleep? Stress and anxiety? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> of course it is, and that's part of what cognitive behavioral therapy, that's a big piece of it. And for people that have, um, and specific anxiety disorders, we sometimes have to get the psychiatrist and or psychologist involved to treat the underlying anxiety. But that this is a big part of what cognitive behavioral therapy is. It's seeing what software your brain um, uh, needs to be rewired, if you will, or rewritten. And part of that has to do with the anxiety. That's a longer answer. Thank you. about alcohol before sleep, say uh, wine with dinner or having beer while you're watching a game but it's not late in the afternoon, does that affect um, ability to go to sleep or stay asleep? Uh, yes, it can. So when you look at alcohol, it helps you fall asleep faster and some people will start using it as a way to fall asleep, but the alcohol itself um, triggers that hormone in your brain that tells your kidneys to start making urine. And so it causes you to wake up and urinate at night. And it also keeps you in a more superficial stage of sleep. Also, if you're having any problems with restless legs, it can set that off. And then with regards to apnea, um, the alcohol itself can relax the muscles that surround your airway. So I'm not saying get rid of alcohol completely, you may just need to move it to a different time of day. For breakfast. <laughs> so please don't go out and say, Dr. Lance told me to become a day drinker. No, that's not what I'm saying. You just have to be cautious and not having it too close to bedtime or if it's setting off another problem. Well, as I understand it, the brain, you know, alcohol is a brain exciter. It's an initially a depressant, but then an exciter at that four hour mark. So that person has that hot time before bed will sleep for four hours, but then they'll wake up when the excitation cycle starts. Yes, ma'am. That's a much more elegant way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> could, you, could you comment on jet lag and meditation as a way to uh, relax and get to sleep? So um, there's a lot of great apps out right now when it comes to meditation. And that's part of what they work on with cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia um, and muscle relaxation techniques. So that's all wrapped up in the cognitive behavioral therapy program. So the short answer is yes, it works very nicely and a lot of great apps, as long as you're not using them in bed, um, are fine to use. And then you mentioned jet lag specifically. Well, uh, uh, techniques to uh, mitigate the effects ways to mitigate the effects of uh, jet lag going either east or going west, either way. Right, and it usually takes you, especially if you're traveling west, it's much easier. Yeah. Traveling it's east is where it's difficult, and especially if you go from here to Europe, and for each time zone, it takes you a day per time zone to readjust your sleep-wake cycle. Um, there are apps and places online where you can plug in where you're going, where you're starting, where you're going, and it can tell you when to expose yourself to light and right. when to take melatonin to help block the effects of jet lag. Right. So there's, uh, if you look at the National Sleep Foundation, and even if you just put in Google uh, jet lag schedules, I think for a while, TWA even had it on their website where you could put in your travel plans and it, and it would give you advice on how to deal with the jet lag. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just have a question about architecture of sleep. Um, it's, I think you made that one comment about how in ancient times people slept then had story time in the middle of the night and then, then sleep again before waking up during the day. Um, it, it seems to me a lot of people and I was a nurse practitioner in this house, so I talked about sleep a lot. 
a lot of people have an unrealistic expectation of sleeping through the night. Like how many people actually really sleep through the night? You know, myself, I know I wake up usually around three, I have a alarm, a clock that I can have a, uh, piece of a cloth over it so I don't have to see it, but then I can repeat to see the combination of it, and then go back to sleep, because that's part of my natural sleep cycle. And don't many people have sleep cycles that are like that, that are normal, but then you worry about it, and then you, then you medicalize something that's actually normal. Right, and that's why part, that's why um, the first interview for insomnia is usually so long, is dealing with uh, expectations. Because you can have several arousals during the night, but if you're falling back to sleep okay, and or your function during the daytime was fine, then it's not an issue. Or let's see, my favorite one last week was, um, uh, my sister tells me I'm not functioning very well during the day. We go over the sleep-wake cycle. The woman is sleeping eight hours a night. She functions great during the day, but her sleep-wake cycle was uh, she was a night owl, and her sister <laughs> was a morning person, so it was getting her sister in the morning angry that her sister yeah. wouldn't wake up and go do stuff with her. So oh. and, and I'm like, uh, all right, you, you need to have a chat with your sister. So, yeah, so a lot of times what they come in and complain of or think is a medical problem, in fact, is quite normal. Or like the expectation of that I will lay down and be asleep in five minutes, and someone tells you it's 20 or 30. Well, that's completely normal. That's okay. I have a little dog that tends to back, bark at other, other dogs in the neighborhood in the wee hours of the morning. And she goes out and she comes back in and goes right back to sleep. And I'm all wound up. Do you, do you have any, uh, any uh, hints on how to get back to sleep when something wakes you up in the middle of the night? Military grade earplugs. <laughs> They're cheap. It's easy, so you don't hear that dog barking. You haven't heard my dog. <laughs> you haven't. You may have heard mine. <laughs> <laughs> but she won't stop until I get up and take her out. Oh. I, don't oh. 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 I don't necessarily have really great suggestions as far as the dog and behavioral training there. However, um, I know some people will choose to get up and do something for a while that's dull and boring so that you don't get too excited and when you feel you're ready to go back to bed, go back to bed and finish out your I, your sleep period. I try reading a boring book. Yeah, it's got to be boring. It can't be stimulating. I noticed that when you talked about screens and electronics, you didn't say anything about TV. My TV is in the bedroom, and I often go to sleep with the TV on because that helps put me to right. sleep. Mm -hmm. Am I extraordinarily unusual in that, no, or is no. <laughs> Yes, you are. <laughs> well, I'm unusual in many other ways, too. I, I left that under the umbrella category. Yeah, the TV <laughs> needs to be away from bedtime and out of the bedroom, if at all possible. Um, I know in our household, there are no TVs in any bedrooms. Um, the blue light that comes from the screen, itself that hits that portion of your brain it's called the suprachiasmic nucleus and sends triggers that it's time to be awake so it also behaviorally it tells you that being in bed in the bedroom is a place to do other things um, it seems to be that women tend to need something more noise wise especially if they live alone just because it's part of it i think might be fear yeah. Or, I mean, not, maybe not in, in particular, but what I tend to see is, is women need something noise-wise going on around yeah. them yeah, in order to fall asleep. Yeah, the radio too. Right. And the dishwasher. Yeah, just something, almost like yeah. a background noise. Um, but if, if you can't get away from the TV, absolutely at least put it on a timer. <coughs> and there are even filters, there are settings on some of the newer TVs that filter out the blue light. And there are even, you know, if you really can't turn the devices off, there's even um, ways, they look like big orange screens that filter out the blue light that you can put over your device. There's even a man in Shaker that makes them. Hmm. Over in the, above Pizzazz. Yeah, it filters out the, yeah, new devices. Yeah. 
practice glasses and goggles you can wear to filter out the blue light. I think it's a little low. sexy. <laughs> got a blue light. <laughs> but it's quite a big guy. I was diagnosed with tooth anxiety when I was about 32 years old. I was very ill, and they couldn't find out what was going on. And my sleeping was terrible. I get anxious when I get into bed because I wouldn't go to sleep. And the doctor gave me lazapan, and I took it for 40 years. It was the same dose every night for 40 years, and I would go right to sleep and I'd sleep all night. I went to see a gerontologist, and she actually refuses to let me take it. So I have tooth issues, and I'm playing around with GM Tylenol and other things, and it seems to be working, but I don't know that that's a good answer to either. Can you explain why she asked me to stop, stop taking the lazapan? She said it felt it was depressing mentally. Right, there's, some, uh, there's some evidence that using medications in that class long term start changing your sleep architecture and um, can worsen some underlying neurological problems and long term memory issues. Um, and lorazepam was, it, it's in that class of drugs like cousins of Valium and all, and they're used to treat anxiety. Right. Not really indicated uh, for treating insomnia itself. Um, personally, I. Very rarely do I start medication and keep people on it for very long because the most successful thing is still cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia with very short term use of sleeping medication. What happens is um, not as much with the newer medications, but some of our older ones that people reach for to treat insomnia and or anxiety have a physiologic addicting quality to it also. And then when you come off it, you have to very slowly come off of it. And also it relaxes the airway. So if you have an airway that's set up for apnea, we try not to use that class of drugs just because it will relax the muscles that surround your airway. So the side effect profile of it, if you will, when you start weighing the uh, plus and minuses, and we really steered away from using those medications. Personally, I try not to start sleeping pills if at all possible and really good cognitive behavioral therapy on board. And then if I have to, it's very short acting um, sleeping, specific sleeping pills. Suppose we have time. Uh, one of your graphs of the uh, uh, sunlight stimulation, what about people that live way north in areas where the land of the midnight sun is. I was going to say like here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, moved I, from, I moved from Houston, so right, I was right. going to say here. Cleveland. Yeah. Uh, I mean, what do uh, they do? Like, like so I can tell you what I did. So um, I am very tightly entrained to sunlight. So sunlight is a big trigger for me. I'm awake when the sun is up. I go to sleep when the sun goes down. So when I moved here a few years ago, I couldn't stay awake here in the winter. It was just, it was horrible. So um, we can use blue light. And for me, I use blue light in the evening during the winter to help me stay awake in the evenings. Otherwise, I'd be asleep at 5 or 6 o'clock. Yeah. Um, so when I go home from work, I spend about 30 minutes in front of a blue light, or I have it in the room with me. And it helps keep my sleep-wake cycle somewhere sane um, so I can function. Uh, but yes, the, we can artificially use blue light now. And even Philips has um, you know, natural daylight light bulbs that help a lot with mood too. Any more questions? Well, where do you get those blue lights in Philips? Oh, Amazon, like everything else. <laughs> <laughs> Are those known as happy lights? Um, I've heard the phrase. I think, I think there's a, you know, we also use bright light for seasonal affective disorder. Um, so some people are term, termed them that. There is, if you just put in Google or put in Amazon, blue, uh, blue light. I know Philips has one. Yeah, Verilux has a light box. You'll see a lot of choices and just see what fits for you. One caveat to using mm -hmm. bright light, if you have any ret problems with your retina, you need to check with your eye doctor because they have to be careful of that exposure. 
um, people who have some underlying um, psychiatric disorders or bipolar disorder. Uh, we have to be careful with bright light because it can set off a manic episode. <laughs> and seizures. It can also lower the seizure threshold. So you have to be careful of those three populations. As long as we're talking about lights, I'm going through a quandary this last month or so over what lights to buy at the hardware store. I go to Sacred Hardware. They have these LED lights, mm -hmm. and I bought one package, and I noticed that they're very blue. And so I was talking to my eye doctor about it, and she was, I, I don't know. <laughs> I understand what she was telling me, but I went back to the hardware store, and they have LED lights in basically what sort of a yellow hue and a blue hue. Which one is better? <laughs> I'm not sure I can answer that. <laughs> I just, I like the natural... I, I get confused in there too. And I, there's a website I think called bulbs.com. I look at that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I can't really answer your question. Okay. All right. But um, I know personally I look for the Philips natural light because at least that, that dark yellow seems to be depressing. But that's just me. Yes, ma'am. Um, do women who are over way over women who are way over a half a century do they still get hormonal imbalances that can affect their sleep? Yes, and amen. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we used to think that people would go through menopause and after a couple of years the effects would wear off, but there are some women who can, for more than a decade, still have hot flashes. Oh. Um, and it can be debilitating. So just when you think it's over, so the short answer is yes, and it greatly affects your sleep because for most of your life, your brain has been used to having estrogen and progesterone around. So there's estrogen and progesterone receptors all throughout your brain, and then all of a sudden the hormones are gone, and your brain is looking for those hormones. And part of what we see is insomnia, the hot flashes are the most obvious mm -hmm. symptom of that. Um, and then if you have apnea, every time you have an apneic event, it sets off a hot flash. <laughs> so the two wow. can be intertwined, <laughs> yay. Um, so we used to use a lot of hormone therapy, but then that fell out of favor. We're starting to bring it back. It's not all evil. We use a little bit of hormone <laughs> yeah. therapy, so we work with the gynecologist to try to get a little bit of hormones back on board when it's debilitating. Um, there are medications that can specifically target um, hot flash symptoms. They're usually in the antidepressant class, but they have a side effect of lessening the hormone uh, or the hot flash symptoms. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. You guys are wonderful. Thank you. Got a couple of announcements here. Uh, thank you, doctors Lance and Coor. That's that was excellent. Uh, next week we have the Ohio forum is the Ohio Electric Grid and the Future of Renewable Energy. Uh, the service today is talking about white fragility and aspects of racism. Uh, please, you all are welcome to stay. And then post-service, we will be having a discussion on a book called White, White Fragility and Aspects of Racism, and you are welcome to stay for that as well. Thank you. Thank you.